This is a video describing the various models of the atom that we've used over the last 250 years or so. The key thing is that as scientists have done experiments, they've used their data to update and improve the model of the atom that we currently use. If you're doing A-level chemistry, we're not going to go into subshells and orbitals in this video. That is covered separately in the video about electron arrangement. So the first modern model of an atom that we're interested in was developed by John Dalton, who is a British chemist, physicist and school teacher. He thought that atoms were fundamental particles, and that means they can't be split up into anything smaller. He described them as being like indivisible spheres, like billiard balls. So if you imagine a billiard ball or a snooker ball, you can't really break it apart into anything smaller. It's just one big solid ball. He was superseded by J.J. Thompson. Note the absence of a P in his surname. Thompson discovered the electron, and he was also responsible for measuring its mass, which he showed was several orders of magnitude smaller than that of an atom. So it turned out that atoms weren't fundamental. They could be split into something smaller, like an electron. So he developed what we call the plum pudding model. So a plum pudding is a bit like a Christmas pudding, if you imagine um, that big squashy spongy bit and then there are sultanas inside it. Um, he thought that the atom was a big ball of positive charge with these little negative electrons stuck into it. Now you really want to be sure about what's going on with the plum pudding model because it's the one you're most likely to be asked to contrast with a modern model of the atom. So this is a typical A-level exam question. State two differences between the plum pudding model and the model of atomic structure that we use today. So the key things to note here are that we don't have a nucleus, we don't have protons in the centre, we've just got positive charge throughout, and the electrons aren't outside the atom, they're inside it, they're not in shells. So our two marks here would be for saying that the plum pudding model doesn't have a nucleus and the plum pudding model doesn't arrange the electrons in shells. So from JJ Thompson and his plum pudding model, we move on to New Zealand born physicist Ernest Rutherford and the nuclear model. And he's one of the few scientists where you should really know a bit about the experiments he did to draw his conclusions. Rutherford developed his nuclear model following an experiment that he did with his students Geiger and Marston called the alpha scattering experiment. They took a source of alpha particles, which are two protons and two neutrons, so exactly the same thing as a helium nucleus, and they fired those alpha particles at a very thin piece of gold leaf or gold foil. And they would have expected, if the plum pudding model had been accurate, that these would have all behaved in a fairly uniform way because the plum pudding model was fairly uniform. And this would have meant that either they were all deflected straight back or that they all went straight through. And actually, based on observations that had already been made, that was really what they were expecting. Now that might seem a little bit counterintuitive because the plum pudding model suggests that the atom is fairly solid, but you can think of this a bit like trying to launch a bowling ball through a wall made out of tissue paper. Even though the tissue paper is solid, it's not enough to stop the bowling ball. Now, based on this experiment, they made two key observations and from this they made three conclusions. The first observation was that the vast, vast majority of the alpha particles did go straight through. And from this, they concluded that actually what was happening was that the vast majority of the atom was empty space. The second observation they made was that some of them were deflected back in what we call backscattering. And some of these were deflected um, slightly to the side and some of them, a very, very small number, bounced straight back at them. And what they concluded was two things. One, that most of the mass of the atom was actually concentrated in the center. So for all of the particles that were going slightly to the left or slightly to the right of that nucleus, there was nothing preventing them from moving. Um, but for the ones that hit dead on straight in the middle, all of the mass was there. And so they were deflected really quite strongly. The second thing they concluded was that this deflection was evidence that the nucleus was positively charged because the alpha particle was positively charged, having two protons in it, and the nucleus was then repelling it. So it must also have the same charge. Next, Danish physicist Niels Bohr developed the quantum model of the atom. And this is where we start to see electrons being arranged in different shells. Now, if you're doing A-level chemistry, this is about to get a bit more complicated, but you're already familiar from GCSE with the idea that electrons orbit the nucleus at fixed distances, and these correspond with energy levels. It's hard to pinpoint exactly when scientists became aware that the nucleus wasn't just a single ball of positive charge. It was actually made of further particles. Basically, there were a whole bunch of physicists doing nuclear experiments where they were firing alpha particles and other things at atoms and changing them into different elements. And some point along the way, they became aware that this had something to do with hydrogen nuclei, and they started referring to these hydrogen nuclei as protons. Now, one of the first to do this was Rutherford in about 1920, but we don't know exactly who coined the term. <laughs> 
then in 1932, James Chadwick discovered the neutron. And this was really, really important because it allowed us to start discussing isotopes. There's different versions of an atom that have the same number of protons, but different numbers of neutrons and therefore different atomic masses. So that brings us up to date with all of the models of the atom that you were expected to know about for GCSE. And if you've watched my GCSE videos, you've probably seen this slide before. So if you've made it this far, then you're aware that the model of the atom that we use today is made up of the subatomic particles, protons, electrons and neutrons. And the protons and neutrons are in the nucleus and the electrons fly in shells around the outside. Now, there's a new word for you if you're starting A level, which is nucleon. So a nucleon is anything that we find in the nucleus. So a proton is a nucleon and so is a neutron. And they're held together by what we call a strong nuclear force. And this is much, much stronger than the strong electrostatic force between positive and negative things or positive and positive things. So that's why the protons are able to stay in the nucleus together, even though they're all positively charged. It's partly because the neutrons are in there to kind of act as a buffer, but it's also because this strong nuclear force is holding them together. Now, at GCSE, you would have been expected to write your answers in terms of relative masses and relative charges, but it's possible that nobody ever actually explained to you why it is that we're using these. So what you have to bear in mind is just how small these atoms are. As we see here, they've got a radius of about 0.1 nanometers. Now, what that means is that standard international units are not very useful for describing atoms. I mean, we could. One proton has a mass of about 1.67 times 10 to the minus 27 kilograms, and it has a charge of positive 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Those are really, really small numbers, and they're a real pain to work with. So instead, we kind of made up our own units based on an atom. So we talk about atomic mass units, which are one twelfth of the mass of a single carbon 12 atom, and elementary charge units, which are the charge on an electron. Realistically, though, we're probably still going to end up rounding. So the mass of a proton or a neutron becomes one atomic mass unit, and then the charge of a proton becomes plus one, and the charge of an electron becomes minus one. Unfortunately, just because doing calculations with SI units isn't very sensible doesn't mean that the exam board aren't ever going to ask you to do it. So this is an example of how they might. You can see here that they've given you the mass of protons and neutrons in grams in standard form. And then the electrons, you'll notice, is not actually in standard form. They've tried to be helpful and given it to you so that it's all times 10 to the minus 24 in the same way that the protons and the neutrons are. So all this question is really testing is, do you know what a hydrogen atom looks like? Do you know that it's one proton? and one electron and no neutrons. And if you do know that, then you can just add up those masses together. Now, the way they could make this slightly more complicated is to give you a more complicated species. So for instance, if they gave you a fluorine molecule, then you would need to know that fluorine has nine protons and therefore nine electrons and 10 neutrons. And that in a fluorine molecule, you're always going to have two atoms. So then you need twice as many of those. And you could see how it could become a slightly longer calculation, but still nothing that you can't handle. Hopefully that was a useful refresher of the GCC content and a helpful start to the A-level chemistry course. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe.